going to hit, hit resume recording. You should get an alert about that as well. So officially welcome. Um, it's July 26, 2021 and the pandemic is ongoing, um, unfortunately. But um, fortunately, technology has allowed us the opportunity to create community in other ways. Uh, my name is Mia. I'm a general surgeon here at UTHSC, um, a humble servant of the Global Surgery Institute alongside my partner, Dennis Feredia, who will introduce himself as well here in just a second. Um, as I stated just a moment ago, um, COVID and surgery conversations is an attempt um, that we began last year to um, formally bring together partners and friends and colleagues much in the same way that we all do when we have a difficult case. We turn to our friends and colleagues to ask them, what are you experiencing? What have you seen and what have you done? And similarly with COVID-19, for better or worse, we have a common foe at the same time or somewhat similar timelines. And so wonderfully, we get to learn together, um, both our successes and our, our regrets. Um, and today um, uh, um, would like to first, uh, before I introduce our esteemed speaker, would like to go around the um, uh, virtual room and just welcome our community formally by allowing you to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and uh, what you do um, and kind of how uh, you came to join us this morning. Um, I'll be going down my little row of participants on the right. And uh, first off, I have Dr. Brodus Franklin. Hello, everyone. Brodus Franklin. I'm a business operations associate for Baylor Global Health at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, I'm here just to, to hear this very engaging talk, which I'm sure it will be. Thanks for the invite. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Dennis Fredia is uh, uh, my, my partner in crime. <laughs> Um, thank you, Nia. For some reason, I'm, I'm trying to uh, get my, my video to work. That way uh, I, I get to virtually meet uh, Dr. Ndao. Um, but uh, while I do that, Dr. Ndao, it's a great honor to, to have you visit us. Um, I, I remember hearing your talk uh, um, through the uh, Global Anesthesia um, and Dr. Bok. So it's very, it, it's very exciting to have you. Um, I am Dennis Ferretia. I am originally from Cameroon, um, and I'm the Associate Director for um, the Global Surgery Institute. And um, I'm also a, a, a general surgeon like uh, my partner, Dr. Zalamea. Um, and uh, I've been now at U UTHC close to three years, and very excited you know, um, with, with our work to, to expand surgery across, the, uh, across low and medium income countries. Thank you. Um, next on the list, I have um, whoever is behind iPhone SA. <laughs> uh, that's me, uh, Sharmila Nandasabhapathy from Baylor Global Health. And uh, I'm so glad Dr. Steve Boggs uh, told me this was happening. And James, we're so happy to hear you again. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you for, for also helping us earlier. <laughs> Um, Carrie Ann Bingham is next. And Carrie Ann may or may not be ready to introduce herself. <laughs> we'll go ahead to Dr. Steve Boggs, our uh, uh, chair of the De uh, Department of Anesthesia. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nia and uh, Dennis and uh, James. I'm delighted to. Uh, to virtually see you again. I'm on my iPhone and I'm supervising two residents this morning, so I'll probably have to scamper off in a bit, but I'm just delighted. I think uh, in addition to having you have an adopted home in uh, Houston now, you've got another adopted home in Memphis, Tennessee. So uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't escape us. <laughs> anyway, I very much looking look forward to hearing what, what parts of your lecture I'll be able to hear before I have to go supervise my first years. Thanks so much, Dr. Boggs. Um, Dr. Austin Dalgo. Good morning. Uh, my name is Austin Dalgo. I'm a, an internal medicine and palliative care physician here in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm from a strange land called Alabama. 
um, where the vaccination rates are lower than at many places around the world. And, uh, and so my main job is a bioethicist here at the Children's Hospital. And I've been working with Dennis and Nia and global health uh, efforts. And we uh, here in the pediatric department have a, a global health track uh, that, that um, I'm supervising since July. So we have about 20 residents in that global health track here. Wonderful. And Dr. Dago is uh, one of our associate directors for the Center for Multicultural and Global Health, which Dr. Fredia is, a, is director of as well. Um, have Anna Connor next. Hi, um, I'm an M1 at UT. I'm from Chattanooga and I'm now in Memphis and I just thought it sounded really interesting. So I'm excited. Welcome, Anna. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Jocelyn Burridge. Uh, my name is Josie. I'm from Houston originally, but I went to the University of Michigan and was involved in a few global health programs there. Uh, I'm currently a grad student at U of M and working as the global health fellow at Baylor. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this lecture. Wow, Josie, what, what connectivity. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, and Carrie Ann Bingham, I don't know if you're ready. not no worries we can hit you up later okay carrie ann we'll come back around to you later so we can uh know who you are and um just thanks so much we're so honored um to welcome dr endow um here at uthsc uh virtually um sir thanks so much for coming um uh we were first introduced to dr endow um as you all might have heard um through Dr. Stephen Boggs, um, who invited him uh, for a global anesthesia talk, which was incredible. Um, and we were so moved. Uh, we really wanted to hear more. Um, as um, uh, I mentioned earlier, much of this, um, uh, this uh, uh, conversation series has just been about sharing experiences and sharing knowledge um, and uh, creating um, potentially some new knowledge and ideas that we might be able to apply at home. Dr. Endow is very uh, experienced in that. Um, he's a professor of urological surgery at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He's played a significant role in um, essentially founding the academic portion um, of the uh, urology unit there as the director. And he's paid special attention to cancer care, which of course is a significant part of urological surgery. So much so that, so that he founded um, an organization called UCAN or UCAN which is a charity um, uh, focused on um, Scottish uh, urological cancer care, not only in access, um, but also in quality, which is just incredible. Um, I think based on my reading, I can um, pinpoint that you along with others, Dr. Endow, are responsible for bringing robotics to Scotland, uh, which is incredible. Um, uh, again, just in terms of not just only access, but quality care and getting back to life. He is the chairman of the European Association of Urology Guidelines and also founder of the Horizons Trust UK, which is a, a really interesting um, organization that connects um, commercial enterprise to charitable work and really opening doors to provision of care for those who cannot otherwise receive it. We are so grateful um, to have Dr. Endow here with us today. And I'll quit talking, Dr. Endow, <laughs> so that you can uh, Chad, and, and I, I believe um, we're going to just leave up the screen if that's okay, Dr. Endow, unless you need to share a screen. Without uh, further ado, thank you. Nia, thank you ever so much, and thank you all for, for being here so early for you. Um, and um, apologies, uh, the sun is not often out in Aberdeen in Scotland, but it's out today. And I was sitting here contemplating joining you at 2 p.m. my time, <laughs> wrongly so having a coffee and, and really just idling. So uh, next time, uh, Shamil and Brodus, I'm sure have my mobile, just kick me next time. <laughs> Whatever's not in my diary at a particular time is not happening. So my good secretary, God bless her, as they say in at, at 2 p.m. UK time. But anyway, here I am, and it's, it's a real honor. And, and I suppose, um, let me just paint a little bit of a picture. Um, so I, I'm sitting here 
in Aberdeen. And normally before COVID, um, I would be maybe working like you, 14 to 16 hours a day, traveling almost every second week, if not weekly, um, across Europe mainly. But of course, I'm going to Gambia six times a year on charitable missions. And uh, I work across the NHS in, here in, in, in Scotland and, of, and also in the University of Aberdeen, the academic unit. But also I look after up until last week, the guidelines office in the European Association of Urology. And that's a, a society of 19,000 surgeon members. Um, and I've transitioned now to look after the education portfolio across the society. Of course, with Bailey and others, I've got a passion for the Gambia. I was born and bred in the Gambia and um, we're doing some uh, nice work until it was, it was interrupted by COVID. Uh, let me just say, I'm a little bit of a, of a germaphobe, right? And um, I, I would say with an ever so slightly more than a sprinkling of OCD tied to it, but um, bizarrely with, um, with COVID, I've never felt safer interacting with people and using public transport. It's, it's, an, odd, it's an odd feeling that I should feel unsafe, but actually I don't because for a change, I don't, I don't have people next to me coughing and without a mask or covering their mouths. And, you know, I, everybody's in a mask. And so I, I, I must say, I, I walked around happy as Larry, whilst everybody is hiding, <laughs> I'm feeling in my comfort zone. But clearly, of course, joking apart, the 23rd of March, our lives changed, right? And um, instantaneously in Scotland. And um, we've had a lot of challenges. Um, most important challenge has been the leadership void in the UK, but not only in the UK, I think globally. We, you don't know how, how important good leadership is until uh, until you really run into trouble. And really, we have not been so blessed. In Scotland, I must say our own first minister has done a very good job, but we are part of the UK as a whole and the UK government, um, if I may be honest with you, has been embarrassingly inconsistent. And really a lot of people have died that should never have died probably. Um, but uh, coming back to, I suppose, my own life as a surgeon, um, I've always regarded adversity as an opportunity, right? Because in adversity, I always feel all of our competitors are so busy focusing on the adversity. It's time to move seamlessly forward. And um, although we've had to change how we work, I've had time because I've not had to travel so much, right? And I've had time to recalibrate, to refocus. I've recognized that empathy and compassion is needed, obviously. And um, it was time for um, giving more love to my family, to friends, to strangers, right? Because we had time, we had time to think and these are the little things that we take for granted that, yes, I'm a surgeon, but firstly, I'm a doctor. But even before that, we're just human beings, right? We're just human beings and, and our professions don't define us, right? They don't define us and neither does COVID. So I, I have certainly found this past 18 months, albeit strange, but I've, I, I've, I've used it as time to just get back to the basics of humanity, what it means to me at least. And, you know, my family and loved ones, making sure everybody's okay. And I've paid more attention to my kids. Um, uh, even right at the moment, Steve would know this, Steve Boggs, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm writing a book uh, and my son is ghostwriting it. And that's been a fascinating experience because it means I have to talk to him, not as a father, uh, but as somebody I'm actually doing, uh, doing something important with. I, I've discovered the Hoover in my house. Um, 
it's been a long time, I must say. I've, I've discovered the dishwasher, um, the ironing board. You know, these are these are things that amazed my wife, right? And but even more so, amazed my kids that I had the capacity and the capability to first discover it, but to use them. But um, I, I think, in a lot of ways, it's been good for um, the the family side of things, clearly. But I will finish that section by saying I would, wouldn't be honest if I didn't say that my wife is just desperate for me to leave the house now, really. She, she, she's really had enough now. So um, I think she, <laughs> for many years she told people she was almost like a single mom because I was never home. Now she can't wait to see the back of me. So, okay, COVID has had its positives on that side. As a urological surgeon, I would say that we've treated fewer cancers, which is a concern. I think fewer cancers have presented, which is even a bigger concern, because I would imagine that we will, we will have a big wave of later diagnosis coming. The Urology Cancer Support Center that we have is co-located on the ward, and it, it was an amazing intervention 15 years ago, driven by patient need, telling us that when they have a cancer, we do our best to cure them but we're terrible at pre preparation for surgery, information provision in a language they can understand, um, supporting them and their family throughout their cancer journey. When they go home after discharge from hospital, we think their family physician's looking after them. The family physician thinks we're still looking after them. Frankly, nobody was. And so this cancer center was established with four cancer specialists, five cancer specialist nurses, it, you know, we, we make amazing teas and coffees and it's a drop-in center. People can walk from the street, bring their aunts, uncles, friends. Um, uh, you know, we, we have a body system where we connect patients to those who have been through a similar journey and really transformed how we practiced and really brought back the caring of what the NHS should, should mean. That I must say has been lost over the past 18 months. Right. And, and for me, having learned how good it could be for patients and having realized how bad it was before 15 years ago, to now feel as if we're back to pre-15 years ago, for me, really is one of the great sadness for me as a doctor. But we are slowly building up again. The doors are open again. But we still have, in the UK, I don't know, over 4.7 million people waiting for procedures over 400,000 waiting for more than a year. These are for 18 week deadline procedures. So they, they've waited, can you imagine you're putting your life on hold um, for over a year. Our OR, our operating, we for the first eight weeks of COVID, we perhaps ran at about 25% um, operating and 25% diagnostics. But after that, once we regrouped after six to eight weeks, we were operating at about 85 to 95% or all the way through COVID. And even through this, the third wave that we're going through now, what I must say we haven't done so well are the benign cases. 60% of our work is cancer, but the other 40% is benign. And the benign cases have almost been, well, they've been left behind, if not forgotten. They're not forgotten completely, but forgotten enough. And you know, when you have incontinence and you're wet all the time, you know, you can't leave the house. Yes, cancer is important, but so is, you know, so is your quality of life if you cannot exist as a human being as you would want to. So I think certainly we have lots to learn to make sure that, God forbid, this ever happens again, that we don't only focus on cancer, right? Because that's, that's just not right. Um, I, I think we as a team, surgical team and healthcare provi pro providing team in urology have gone closer, we've become closer, we've had more meetings, um, uh, and I think that side has been positive. On the research side, I must say I've had so much time and we've been super successful in the past 18 months, we've just got another 21.3 million Euro project funded by the European Commission in June, looking at big data um, uh, uh, in prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer, interfacing guidelines with real world data and artificial intelligence. 
with a consortium of 35 partners across a number of European countries. Um, so in terms of productivity, um, the research side has not suffered. It's been harder on the staff because you know, you're existing in Zoom or Teams and that's not easy. But I must say we've kept everybody so busy that <laughs> Um, you don't have time to think about how miserable you probably could be, right? And um, we ran a fantastic study a thon on a previously funded program by the European Commission on prostate cancer. We ran a study a thon looking at um, watchful waiting. Patients were managed by watchful waiting, no curative intent. And we had participants from um, 200 or so participants from across the world. We had data sets from China, from Europe, from the US, from the VA, from Stanford, from, from others. And we had 1.4 million patients that fit that cohort that we could work with five days a week, 24 seven. Um, and that was just, and this was in March, right? In the middle of this COVID, COVID pandemic. And it's been an amazing experience to actually go through that with patients. The patients were part of the study of Thorn and they stayed through it. So that, so the research side has been great. It's, um, you know, I, I don't think we can complain so much apart from not being able to meet. In terms of the guidelines, we have 21 guidelines that are updated every year. Normally panel members meet two to four times a year for their panels to prepare. They had to do 2020 update and 2021 update all virtually, all year round. And that has been hard because these are volunteers about 300 key opinion leaders and young, talented academic surgeons uh, and patients and others that participate. And, and it's been hard for them to do that because the only benefit they have sometimes is we pay for them to meet. They enjoy each other's company, have a nice lunch or dinner and go back home. This is the only payment they get. So for two years, two year cycle updates, they've had to do this completely virtually. And and then last year, of course, in March, they were asked that the deadline for releasing the guidelines is usually around the end of March. And they were asked mid-March to revisit all of their recommendations across all 21 guidelines to reframe them for the COVID pandemic, i.e. to inform physicians and patients what can wait, what can be dealt with urgently, what can be deferred for six months, right? So they had to redo, and they did all of that within four weeks a phenomenal piece of work they all had to do. And so that, you know, obviously has been a positive consequence that we, we may be a little bit better prepared if this was to happen again as a guidelines office. And then finally touching on Gambia. Gambia for me has been um, a big challenge. Um, obviously COVID, Gambia has been hit by COVID, but because I think the, the population is much younger right? Um, they, we haven't had so many deaths. I think all the way through COVID, there's only been 200 deaths in the Gambia. We're going through our own third wave now and um, with the Delta variant. And um, But, you know, leadership again has been, ter well, I wouldn't say terrible, but it, it could be better, right? In the sense of preventative strategies, enforcing um, mask wearing and things like that. But when you imagine 60% of the population are, are living below the poverty line, um, social distancing is unworkable when you're a family of seven living in a one bedroom house. I mean, what is social distancing? It's unbelievable. You know, a, a dollar a day, you have to go to the market every day. You cannot stock your fridge and say, I go out only when it's necessary, when it's essential. Well, it's essential if you're poor to go out every day. If you don't go out, you don't eat. So these, you know, even though I think Gambia could have done better, I think these have certainly not been very helpful. And I think finally, um, vaccine hesitancy, they've only vaccinated, I don't know, less than 30,000 people. We've got a population of 2 million, right? Um, uh, fully vaccinated, maybe only about 12,000, right? And um, so, of course, mixed in all of that, you then have vaccine hesitancy because of misinformation, conspiracy theories, uh, and all sorts. And, and I must say, we in the West have not been terribly helpful. You know, for us as educated people to be pushing 
conspiracy theories and misinformation, this has consequences of pe on people, right? People, people die because of this. So I think certainly, um, you know, Gambia has faced its challenges, but that all said on a positive note, you know, our collaboration with Baylor has been fantastic. I know Brodo is here, Shamil is here. You know, they, 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 they've kept the momentum going and things that we would have wanted to do on the ground live with Baylor has all gone virtual. And Brodo's marshals us, you know, every, every so often we get an email kicking us to move. And um, so I think we're excited about things like that. So it's not all been bad. Yes, we would have preferred not to have experienced COVID, but by and large, I think, you know, I, I think it's been, it's been all right. Nia, I think I will stop now, shall I? Thanks so much, Dr. Endow. And um, we, you know, I think that, um, your sentiment about uh, taking us back to kind of the early days of um, having patient and public interactions that are protected now where they had not been, um, you know, just uh, being around folks who suddenly, at least visually, um, uh, perhaps might have the same level of concern about germs and and uh, transmissible things, um, just being around people with masks um, outside of the hospital setting, um, you're not alone in that <laughs> sentiment. And I think um, one of the interesting um, uh, things that's been, that we've kind of listened to over the last um, few months has been um, the role of, of us as surgeons, as physicians, just in, as healthcare people, um, you know, um, in our families, and how do you talk to, for example, your children? Um, not not even talking about public health, you know, sort of things, but just how do you talk to your families and friends, um, colleagues who will pull you aside and, and do that? Hey, doc, um, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? I just wondered if, um, you know, especially if you kind of roll back to March and April of last year, if you can kind of remember what that might've been like for you, if you can give an example of how you might've talked to them about that, to, to tell them what, what is going on. Can you remember talking to your kids about COVID? <laughs> Almost every day. I, I <laughs> must say, my wife's a doctor and she's less of a germaphobe and OCD than I am. And so I spent the first few weeks too busy, not only um, sorting myself, but trying to get her into my space. <laughs> of OCD. So you can imagine the resistance from her side. And, um, uh, and my daughter, of course, just graduated. She graduated, they graduated them early as doctors, okay. right? So she, instead of graduating in the summer, she got graduated in the spring and then sent to the front line, oh, right? Yeah. Whilst um, my wife and I are uh, experienced doctors, um, and, and I don't worry about uh, ourselves so much, apart from my own OCD issues, but I worried about my daughter, right? Because this is my baby girl uh, <laughs> go, being sent to the front line, right? And, and this was in the middle of all of the misinformation by mm -hmm. the leadership misinformation and around masks, right? Aerosol generating procedures, right? Not having the right types of masks, right? Being told it's okay, you know, the, these surgical masks that you normally wear is fine, right? And, and I, as one of the senior ones in our department, had to then stand up and send emails that I wouldn't normally send, right? To say, we, to management and senior people in our own setup to say, guys, we can't be doing this, right? We have to care for patients. Absolutely, we must. But it starts by us caring for each other, right? If we're sick, we're not good to anyone else, right? And our lives matter, right? Our, our, mm -hmm. our surgical team's lives matter. Our nurses' lives matter. We cannot accept anything less than the highest level of protection for being in the front line. That's it. Right. And I think that, you know, those exchanges I, I reflect on and I wish we never had to have them, but it was important to have them. Right. I wish the system 
you know, it's not as if pandemics are a new phenomenon, right? And, and one of the, for me, one of the biggest embarrassments in all of this is, yes, we should be celebrating vaccines, but my goodness, we should be celebrating the availability of a handbook that we have all signed up to across the world to say, for the next pandemic, this is how the world is going to react, right? Yeah. This is how the messaging is going to be. These are the masks that you're going to have. This is how you're going to be protected. This is what we should be celebrating. But I don't know where we are in the world about on that. I've not seen any government, any politician stand up and say, here's this manual. I've spoken to 50 other leaders, our public health experts. We've all signed up to this. This is never going to happen again. To me, this should be the celebration, right? Agreed. I mean, it's unprecedented that everyone has gone through the same pandemic and is going through the same pandemic right now. For, and we've had a, a over one year long experience in learning. Correct. It's an opportunity. Correct. And, and what was <laughs> embarrassing here is that for some of us in Africa, we knew how, how, to, how, to, how to manage ourselves better than people here, right? Because we've lived through some of these, right? We've lived through Ebola, right? And right. when everyone in the West thought Ebola was an African problem, well, sorry, air travel means it's everybody's problem, right? Right, absolutely. On that note, um, Dr. Endow, um, what, you know, in, in speaking to colleagues from Argentina, they had a very early um, focus on preservation of health and integrity of the teams that were working the frontline groups. In the Philippines, that did not exist. They had folks dropping like flies. Um, similarly in Italy, um, they eventually learned their lesson and had to lock down teams a uh, month at a time and, and whatnot. What did you all do in Scotland? Well, I mean, I, I must say that um, we've had health professionals that have died, right, across the UK, um, doctors, nurses, and um, there was a particular higher number of percentage of um, non-white health professionals also that died, right? Um, I don't think we've ever truly got to the bottom of all of that, right, um, in terms of understanding the risks and how to mitigate them. I think certainly as weeks and months went by, certainly our management in, in Aberdeen have been very good. They, 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 sadly, there's constant interference from government, right? And, and in my humble opinion, hardly helpful, right? Um, if they had devolved a lot of this to hospital management, say, guys, these are your teams, you're responsible for them. You know your local context. Get on with it. When you need us, phone us, right? This would have been a lot easier because what was happening was the reverse, where every day, I'm exaggerating perhaps, but every day, every other day, there's a new diktat from government. You must do this. You must do that. So, but the whole hospital, I mean, we, we've got staff. I can't remember how many staff we have in Aberdeen in, 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 the, in, in this uh, northern region, maybe 21,000 or whatever. Right, So you have to marshal a change in how the hospital operates every other day because you have some new, some new diktat. And I think that for me, when I speak with one of my colleagues is in senior management in the hospital, I think that's been perhaps the, the, the most challenging for everyone that you constantly want to look after patients safely, right? You constantly have an obligation to keep your staff safe, right? They're doing their best to do that. But every day, they have to, rather than focus on doing that, they have to focus on reacting to government's new, new unhelpful diktat. So I think for me, yeah, it's difficult to know how well we've done yet. And I think time will tell because nobody's had time to really study the numbers, study the data to say, where did we do well? Where did we not do so well? How many staff went off sick? I mean, at the moment, the biggest disaster is actually people having to self-isolate because they've been pinged as a contact of somebody. So you have you have the service now being being impacted by medical nursing staff not being able to be at work. 
not because they're sick, but because they have to self-isolate. And then every week there's a new rule about how to self-isolate, when to get tested, when to come back. And honestly, you can't keep up. And I think for me, this is one of the biggest dangers, right? The rules are so many, so inconsistent. There isn't one web page that you can go on and say, this is how we deal with COVID in Scotland or in the UK, right? You have to go to multiple pages. And by the time you finish reading multiple pages, you're none the wiser, you're only more confused. Speaking of testing, um, has um, during, especially during your uh, early months there in March and April, was testing available to you as a surgeon? Um, <laughs> let me think back carefully. Um, testing um, was not as accessible at the start, is the first thing to say. Um, they ramped up quickly and things got better quickly, but testing was not so easily accessible. You couldn't just, you know, if you didn't have symptoms, for example, you'd never get tested at the start, right? Sure. Uh, and, you know, and God bless the lateral flow tests. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure how, how helpful, you know, history will, when we look back on history and look at the data, we'll know how useful the lateral flow tests have been, right? Because yeah. I'm not sure they've, they've been as effective in doing what we expected them to do, right? Yeah. So at the moment, um, when I look back, testing, did we have the protocols right? We certainly did in terms of testing patients to come in for surgery, right? So that, mm -hmm. you know, that gave at least us as surgeons confidence that, you know, um, we were not deliberately admitting patients for surgery who had COVID. But I think testing was a big disaster in the UK for many, many, many weeks after the pandemic started. It was terrible. And, and the UK government, um, I must say we're hopeless, right? We're hopeless. And, you know, people like me, I, I suppose, have to every so often put our necks across the parapet a little bit. And, you know, when you look at our own Minister of Health that we had in the UK. Honestly, how he was in a job for 15 months or 16 months, God only knows. Um, and uh, he never filled you with any confidence that, you know, what he's saying was well-informed or, or correct or honest, right? And, and I think these are the things that, you know, people like us are not brave enough to say it in public. These are people maybe we, we, you know, we can be accused that we voted for them finally, right? Or the majority of the country voted for them. But we should be able to hold them to a, a higher level of performance. And when they don't perform, there should be accountability and consequences, right? And, and we have not lived through that in the UK, right? The, the accountability and consequence for poor decisions that cost lives of people, that, that, that gave so many health professionals you know, heartache and, 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 and mental issues and all sorts. There, there's been no accountability for that, right? None whatsoever. Sorry, you're, you're getting me on a rant now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this, this, this kind of leads us to my, what is going to be my last question. I want to allow for others to ask, but, you know, considering where the UK is right now, what would, in an ideal setting, be your next step forward? As a country? I think as a country, we would ideally like consistent messaging, right? Of how are we going to regain our lives, right? This, for me, I don't even mind if we do it wrong. Let's all do it wrong consistently, at least. Learn from it and change, right? But we've, we've lacked consistency for 16 to 18 months. And honestly, the, you know, for three weeks, fine. Three months, fine. But for a year and a half, you would expect our leaders to at least have an idea. And if they don't, to at least phone a friend. Phone somebody who may have done it slightly better than you. Just phone a friend. Say, tell me what you did. And I think for us, this is our, for me, at least personally, 
you know, uh, if we can at least say, guys, we all need to be vaccinated, right? We all need to be vaccinated. Let's not have this discussion about does COVID exist? Um, is the vaccine putting chips into your arm? Let's not have any of this nonsense, right? Let's not have this nonsense about vac you know, vaccine passports infringing on your human rights. Listen, in Africa, there are many countries we couldn't go into without yellow fever certificates. I mean, who died? Nobody died from having a certificate. The bottom line is, if you have evidence that, that some of these things that we're proposing are not right, then come with the evidence. Don't just stand on your platform and, and spout misinformation that actually has negative consequences. I think these are things that, you know, if we can at least just pack these negative um, misinformation and conspiracy theories and actually look forward as a, as a global community to say, we should all be vaccinated. We shouldn't be holding vaccines. If you vaccinated 80% of your population, don't, don't hold back another 50 billion doses of vaccines when people have only vaccinated 1%. Because if they've only vaccinated 1%, we're never gonna get over this pandemic, right? Never. So it's, um, I mean, the list is long near, sadly, of things that yes. we do right going forward, unfortunately. Thanks so much. It makes us makes me want to um, put together a at least a consensus statement just from our our group with <laughs> that's been on this uh, series of talks. But um, wanted to open up um, uh, opportunity for anyone else uh, present to ask any questions, to make any comments. Hi, Professor Indow. Um, I was just wondering, um, do you have any thoughts on probably the optimal? role that the government can play, not only with vaccine hesitancy, um, you talked a little bit about um, the type of information distribution the government has had, um, but you see an optimal way the government can intersect to help uh, with some of the more positive parts of um, healthcare that we have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I actually think that government's responsibility brothers is to understand the people that they are serving right they because if you don't understand them their cultural beliefs right if you don't understand just the basics of how they exist as human beings then it's difficult to engage them in the first instance and the second is it's historically understood that there's always some hesitancy about vaccines for whatever reason, being afraid of needles to, you know, thinking they're putting chips into your, or to monitor your movements. There, there's historically been these issues, right? And we know that in Africa, however, it's not about education. What I've learned very clearly in this pandemic is that education was no hindrance to complete ignorance, right? It's just, I mean, the most educated people were saying the, the craziest things you could have imagined, right? But I think what we've learned, and maybe the West should learn from third world as well in some instances, you know, there, there's, there's, there's always been huge campaigns to get babies vaccinated with a very high success rate. But it takes sensitization of the whole community, community leaders to, to, to buy in, to help you, um, you know, you know reach, reach their people right in a language they understand right um and i think this has been a real missed opportunity and it's not too late i mean it's di more difficult now when you've had presidents of some countries around the world saying crazy things about about the pandemic you know that that has impact right and it's all over not 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 only brazil or us or where i mean they, they, they are all over the world you have some leaders that are really being terribly unhelpful. And I think that has set us back decades, right? But I think we shouldn't accept it as a lost cause because people's lives depend on us not accepting it as a lost cause. We must go back to basics. We must start educating kids, educating elders in the community, edu educating community leaders, educating priests, educating religious leaders and others, right? Parents right, mothers, fathers, about the importance, right? Because it's not so long ago, vaccines, right? Help us get rid of diseases that 
costs so much I mean, it's amazing how terrible historians we are. I mean, we're absolutely hopeless historians. So I think, you know, a little bit of education. I mean, just consistent education, different media, different, different levels of society, I think would not go amiss, brothers. Wonderful question. And, and it, it brought to mind, you know, my mom told me about um, how she would be at school and in, in grade school in the Philippines, you know, maybe six years old or seven years old. And the nurses would come around with a dropper and, and give polio vaccines. And they'll just go home and tell their parents, you know, with a little card that I got this and there was no consent. You know, it was just one of those things that if they could put it in the rice, they would. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was a different era back then. And, and it was one of those things that was clearly in terms of risks and benefits seen as an undeniable benefit that the risks were not worth. And yeah. um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, it's not rocket yeah. science, it's not rocket science. No. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sensitive to the time. Is there any, anyone else have any questions or comments? Well, thanks so much um, to to everyone who came. Uh, oh, Dr. Eubanks is here. <laughs> uh, he just missed us. You, I think he thought it was at eight o'clock also. <laughs> um, oh, but no. we will, <laughs> we will um, definitely be sharing this on our YouTube channel, Dr. Endow. Um, I'm gonna think a little bit more on, on this idea of, of um, you know, we've had uh, several, almost a year now of these conversations of putting them together in, in terms of uh, just some shared perspective, but I'll, I'll email you about that later on. And, and it's my sincere hope that one day we'll be able to bring you here, not virtually, but in person. Uh, so we can sit across the table over a meal um, and uh, we are just so grateful for your time and your energy. And I apologize about the time mix up. Well, uh, I think we should be <laughs> apologizing, me and my secretary, because really, uh, for anyone who knows me, wh whatever's in my diary, I'm like, I don't need any, uh, any guidance. I just follow my diary, you see. And, and I take it with great trust that everything is in my diary correctly. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was delighted to be here and delighted to join you and um, I'd be really interested in, in seeing the views of others and how they've coped and um, because it's been, it's, it's sadly been a learning experience for, it shouldn't have been, but it has yeah. been a learning experience, eh? Absolutely. Um, I'll be frank, these conversations um, virtually started off as virtual therapy for most of us. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, it was what it is. One way, it's one way of surviving the pandemic, right? To make sure men mentally we are all um, attuned and we know that others around the world care and they're suffering as much as we're suffering and, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. And because there is, there always is. Absolutely. That comes to an end at some point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I hope you have a great evening there in the UK. And um, Dr. Franklin, it's wonderful to meet you and, and um, uh, Carrie Ann and uh, Josie as well. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much. God thank bless. You. Yeah, thank you so much. That, that was great. Thank you. Thank you.